Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the midweek Bible study of the Center of Each Bible Church, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's great to have you this evening for those who are here in person and those who are watching on Facebook Live and those who are watching on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and notification button. And we thank you for joining in uh, to our midweek study. And this is probably the most intense of anything we do is Wednesday night. And, uh, it either draws people in or has them running out scared to death. So uh, we are in the book of Revelation. For those who want to know what's coming, what the future holds, God tells us. He gives us tomorrow's newspaper today. And that is what this series is called. Uh, we are up to part 25 in our series of tomorrow's newspaper today. We took a poll because we always go through books of the Bible verse by verse, and we finished the last book. You guys remember what was the last book we finished? How smart you are before this. Song of Solomon, right? That was a lot of fun. That was a great book. Yeah, I really, yeah, that was a, that was a great love story, uh, prophecy. It was, it was everything. But anyway, uh, we took a poll every time we do a, a, a new book, and everybody, well, not everybody, but a vast majority of people wanted to do Revelation. So I said, okay, let's do it. So uh, let's begin by reading Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. We start each week with this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for those who are here in person, Lord, those watching online, Lord. And uh, we pray, Father, that you would give the winds a mighty voice and take this message to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond. And if not there, take it out to those who are watching online. And if not there, take it to those who are sitting in the pews here. And if not there, take it into my heart, Lord, that uh, as we watch these things, we learn these things. Uh, some of these things are frightening, but for those who are on the right side of you, Lord, for those who are children of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, you're our Father, we're your children, and you will take care of us. And though the world is crazy and spiraling out of control, it is uh, not falling out of control. It is getting right where it needs to be. Things are not falling apart. They're falling into place as you predicted they would. Uh, we have nothing to fear, Lord. Uh, but we should be wise and, and really tell all of our loved ones about you, Lord. Uh, that is the answer. So we pray over this study tonight as we try to finish up uh, the church in Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3. And uh, we pray all these things. We'll let you be pleased in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, so we're up to chapter 3 of Revelation, part 7. And we're continuing in the Church of Philadelphia. And if you remember, this, it's, it's a lot to teach on. So this is part four of four of the Church in Philadelphia. So you have a lot to remember. This is part 25 of the series, chapter three of Revelation, uh, part seven of that series, and part four of four of the series on Philadelphia. So if you can figure that out, you're pretty smart. Uh, but anyway, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to the Apostle John. He's the last living apostle at this time. He's in prison in the island of Patmos uh, for his stand on Jesus Christ. And uh, if you remember a couple of weeks back, I, I read uh, how all the apostles died. They all died brutal death, deaths. I think only one didn't die a brutal death. Uh, I think it was uh, Matthias. Matthias. Uh, who didn't, but uh, they all suffered for their stand on Jesus Christ. And uh, what we're going to do tonight, normally we have our repertoire is uh, I show you news uh, that's going on in the world for today, and we compare it to what's going on in the Bible, and then we get into our study, our PowerPoint study. And then I usually close with a video clip, but I'm going to do it completely backwards tonight. Uh, I want to show you a short video clip. It's about eight minutes long. Remember, Jesus Christ says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So I want to show you this 
video, which is already a couple of months old. And like I told you guys, uh, it seems like day one, January 1st of 2024, it's been a escalation of things spiraling out of control at a rate that you can't even keep up with. And by the way, before we show this clip, I want to give a plug uh, for our new show. And uh, I always want to clarify this. The new show that me and Pastor Tim do from Arizona is not affiliated with the Center Reach Bible Church. This is something we do on our own. So tomorrow night, if you want to watch it, it's going to be streaming uh, at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern, uh, Eastern Standard Time. So log on to YouTube, Center Reach Bible Church. And, and we'll probably have it up on the uh, uh, Facebook pages and everything. Um, and it will be going on 8 o'clock. It's an hour long. We did an extra long show. I think it's very important. I think it will be a great show to sh uh, share with your friends and your families. And just so you know, uh, our new show is called Redlining at RPM Critical, where we take uh, the world's news. And basically, like we're doing here, but we do it like a new show format. It's kind of fun. And we did it last year, and then we stopped for a while, but we felt it was time to start doing it again. So that's tomorrow night, RPM News, the news network. So we'll see how that goes. But let's, uh, let's look at this clip here and uh, see what you think. Stop stuffing socking wet bags of ice into your cooler. I've got a brand new three on commercial that keeps your food ice cold without ever needing ice. Around 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. In this video, we'll look at two comparisons from the days of Noah to what's going on right now, the heart of the culture of mankind at the time, as well as the genetic manipulation that was going on then and now. In Luke 21 and 29 through 31, Jesus also tells us the parable of the fig tree. And in verse 31, he says, So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Prophecy is our guideline for understanding the time we're living in. So let's evaluate the days of Noah. The biblical account of Noah begins in Genesis 6, approximately 1,600 years since the creation of Adam and Eve. And as the population of the earth increased from Adam and Eve, also, wickedness and evil increased alongside of it. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And say it's undeniable that evil is continually increasing in the times we're in. The last day's prophecy of 2 Timothy 3 tells us this as well. This may partially lead to the fact that we're able to see what is going on around the world every single moment of the day in real time. This also fulfilled another prophecy, though you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. This ability of people running to and fro, and knowledge increasing through technology, may be one of the leading factors as to why evil is increasing in our time, just as it was in the days of Noah. And as we head towards the end of the month of June, or Pride Month, the book of Proverbs has a lot of wisdom in that area, telling us pride goes before destruction, Proverbs 16, 18, and in Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but the humble is wisdom. In Luke 17, verse 28, Jesus says that likewise as it also was in the days of Lot, referencing the rebellion and pride that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, that that would also be a sign of the times. I'd say the culture comparison to the days of Noah and the days of Lot and the times we're living in right now are undeniable. In Genesis 6, 9 through 22, we get more of a framework of what was going on in the days of Noah. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. It's been theorized in Genesis 6 9 that when it says Noah was perfect in his generations, that his bloodline was pure human and not manipulated by the Nephilim of the time. This makes sense to me as to why some of the Old Testament books have lists of names. I never understood the importance of it, but now looking back, God in his wisdom, it makes sense as to one reason would be 
that anybody who tried to claim that Jesus or his previous bloodline were linked to the Nephilim can just look at the names and the records and see that they were not, and that they were perfect in their generations, just like Noah. In Genesis 1, 26-28, God talks about how he created mankind. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. God created Adam in his likeness and then created all the animals and Adam named them. But just as in the days of Noah, told to us in verse 12 in Genesis 6, that all flesh had corrupted their ways. This is exactly what we saw in Genesis 6 when the Nephilim fallen angels manipulating the genetics of human beings when they made it with women and created giants. Also, in the book of Giants, the apocryphal book, it tells us that the Nephilim also genetically manipulated animals at the time. Human hybrids and animal hybrids, this was going on because of the fallen angels, the Nephilim that were on the earth, and the corruption of all flesh. And what do we see in the headlines of our days? June 16, 2023, most advanced synthetic human embryos yet sparked controversy. Two teams of scientists have announced that they have grown embryo-like structures made entirely from human stem cells that are more advanced than any previous efforts. The synthetic embryos developed to a stage equivalent to that of natural embryos about 14 days after fertilization. Both teams allowed their embryo-like structures to self-assemble from human embryonic stem cells, some of which had been converted into cell types resembling the stem cells that from a placenta and the cells that form the yolk sac outside a natural developing embryo. Here's another headline from May 6, 2021. Scientists make embryos that are part human, part monkey. Scientists working in China and the U.S. have successfully grown chimeric embryos that were created by injecting human cells into the embryos of monkeys for a considerable length of time amid ethical concerns. A human-animal chimera is a life form that is part human and part animal. Theoretically, it can develop into an animal with both animal and human cells and implant it into the uterus of an animal, or possibly even a human. Now, these are just the headlines of our day, public knowledge. But imagine what's going on around the world in black sites and beyond top secret facilities where they don't have any regulatory oversight. You can guarantee that they're doing experiments that are outside of the ethical code that scientists within our country are supposed to follow. There's also the rumor that the military secret advanced technology is truly about 20 years above what we know publicly at our time. So you can just imagine if this is public knowledge, what is really going on in the secret facilities around the world. Two examples of technology that was created and then later released to the public years down the line was GPS development, which started in 1973, with the first satellite launched in 1978. The U.S. government made it available for civilian use in 1983, but it took a few more years to become developed to be sufficient for that purpose. The second case is in the 1960s, when initial development of the internet started. By the early 1980s, it was available to non-military organizations. By the late 1980s, it was in use by universities in various countries, First commercial internet service providers in the US and Australia emerged in the late 1980s. Those are two examples of technology that took 20 to 30 years to be released to the public since their initial development. We don't know the exact day or hour of Jesus' return, but God did give us warning signs and told us to look for them, just as when you see a fig tree coming in season. In Luke 12, 35 through 37, Jesus also reminds us of this saying, let your waist be girded and your legs burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. And when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. In my estimation of the comparison, it's pretty clear to see what it was like in the days of Noah and how those days are coming to a fulfillment in the times we're in. Again, we don't know the day or the hour, but it is important for us to watch and look for them, just like we would for the fig tree blooming. And you want to be in right standing with God, following Jesus in the Bible and what it says, and just how it says in Genesis 6, 9, that Noah was a just man, and that he walked with God. That's how you want to be, so God will create a covenant with you, and you will be on the ark, and God will see you through the times into eternity with him. Let me know in the comments any other comparisons to the days of Noah and the days we're in now. Thanks for watching, and God bless.
Okay, so we're gonna go, now that, that was from June, and we're gonna go to today's news, January uh, 31st, 2024. Let's see what's going on since then, okay? Got some really crazy stuff going on. Uh, let's break that down there, okay. Okay, uh, U.S. is moving nuclear weapons to the United Kingdom report. The outlet reported that the Pentagon documents confirmed the United States is planning to store nuclear warheads three times more powerful than Hiroshima atomic bomb at the U.K. air base. And as we go through all these things, and even as that little video said about playing with DNA strands, I always ask why. Why are, are we doing this? Why are we playing with these things? Why? Why? is the thing, okay? Uh, terrorist arrested in Minnesota, roam free for a year after allegedly crossing the border, uh, caught at the U.S. Uh, southern border. It's obviously, it's, it's a serious problem, people. Uh, let's move up. Uh, this is something that everyone's talking about. 2024 X solar eclipse coincidence or final warning? What's likely to become the biggest travel event during 2024 in America? Some might think it would be the Super Bowl, other sporting events such as Indianapolis 500. However, according to the Washington Post, it will be the solar eclipse that will cross the U.S. on April 8, 2024. This eclipse sparks added interest among prophecy watchers, as we are, as every Christian should be, because of its relationship to another darkening of the sun that occurred on August 21, 2017. The two eclipses, seven years apart, form an X on America, intersecting a little Egypt, a small town in southern Illinois. Isn't that weird? That's weird. It could mean nothing, but it's just the odds of all that happening. So we'll go here. Okay, Neuralink. It just happened. Okay, we're just talking about it. It's already happened. Okay, Neuralink implants, the first human brain chip. Just happened. Elon Musk brain chip startup Neuralink achieved a significant milestone on Sunday, January 28th, 2024, by implanting its first human patient with a brain-computer interface. Mm. Musk said, on Monday, the patient is recovering well. Initial results are showing neuron spike detection. Now, what, do, what does that mean? You'll be able to wirelessly plug into your computer with your brain, and the idea is that you can live forever because you could actually plug in your soul. You don't need a body anymore. You could live vicariously through your computer. And I'm sure they got some other nefarious things that are not going to be good. That's not good, people. It's not good. Okay. Uh, is this going to turn into a civil war? Have you guys been hearing about this? Okay. Texas alternate governor slams the Biden uh, administration for failing to stop the invasion of migrants and calls them a cartel army. He asked if war could break out between Texas National Guard and Border Patrol. And, uh, and just so you know what's going on here, we have, we have two parts of our government. We have the state patrol, the states have their own rights, and we have the federal government. Now, Texas, now, and whether you agree or disagree on any of these things, understand the seriousness here. So the state of Texas is saying, we have all the people come on, they're destroying, and we, I know, you know people who live there, it's bad, and we want to stop them. The federal government says, no, you don't. And they say, yes, we do. So what is going to happen is the federal government can send in the army to fight against Americans, to fight against the National Guard who is defending their state. If you have that, you have citizen against citizen. That is civil war. And the many governors across the lower states are siding with the governor. Uh, the Supreme Court is siding with the president. So you have a standoff now. Are we going to go arrest the governor of Texas and take by force and start shooting at the National Guard? Our own people? It's a scary thing. So, and this is going on right now. They don't know which way it's going to go. There's, there's 700,000 truckers going down. As a matter of fact, we're going to get to it. It's coming up called the Army of God Convoy. Okay, uh, moving on. This stuff, you know, people want to do what they want to do, but this is really just blasphemous. Forces try transgendering Jesus for Holy Week 2024. So for Easter resurrection come, uh, day coming up, 
just in time for Easter Holy Week, anti-Christian forces are trying to transgender God's begotten son, our Lord Jesus, uh, Savior Jesus Christ. The Yahoo headline, Effeminate Christ Poster Angers Spanish Conservatives, should read Effeminate Christ Poster Hurts and Angers Christians world, Worldwide, saying that Jesus was a transgender. Okay. Army of God convoy heads to the border. In the U.S., a convoy of truckers, 700,000, calling themselves God's Army, is preparing to embark on a journey from several locations across the lower 48 states to the southern border as tensions soar between Texas and the Biden administration. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic, uh, on the, in the United Kingdom, in Europe and everything, farmers are breaking down on Europe's capital. They're bearing down. They're having rallies regarding tractors thousands and thousands of farmers protesting in Europe about all the new uh, laws of our climate policy that's destroying the farming industry. These social instabilities are breaking out ahead of key European and U.S. elections this year. Okay, move on. Right here. Political pressure builds on President Biden to strike Iran after U.S. deaths. We have soldiers dead now. American soldiers dead uh, in this war that's not a war. Uh, the killing of three U.S. troops and wounding of dozens more on Sunday by Iran-backed militants is piling political pressure on the president to deal a blow directly against Iran, a move he's been reluctant to do out of fear of igniting a broader war. Uh, he left our troops as sitting ducks. So uh, are we going to go to war with Iran as Iran is in war with uh, Pakistan and Russia is at war with Ukraine? And China is going to be in war with Taiwan and all these things going on in North Korea. And they're all helping each other. So uh, a time of wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and major natural disasters. We know that from Matthew 24. On some level, most people can feel what is coming. Do you think that? Have you talked to people? Do you see people in the streets? People know something's not right. They just know. Believer or non-believer, this it's just something not right. You can feel it. That is why sales of emergency food are at record levels. Shows about survival are among the most popular on television. And Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, is building a self-sustaining doomsday bunker in Hawaii. Millions of us realize that we are on the brink of an extremely chaotic chapter in human history. Okay? Above reproach, uh, and this is the last one, and this is really sad, and I don't blame anyone but Christians for this. Above reproach, fewer Americans see pastors as ethical. <clears throat> Americans have a harder time trusting anyone these days, including pastors. The country's <clears throat> perception of clergy hit a new low in recent Gallup polls, with fewer than a third of Americans rating clergy as highly honest and ethical. You know why? Because they're not honest and ethical okay probably maybe like five percent it's really a sad thing shame on us shame on us shame on us and with that there's no that we have no credibility why should the world listen to us because we made ourselves out to be fools uh we've mishandled the word of god but let's get back to the bible here okay we're in the church of philadelphia revelation uh 3 11 through 13 hopefully we'll finish this tonight and then next week, we'll show you the historical uh, uh, documentary on the Church of Philadelphia. Uh, and we're just going to go over a couple of things from last week. The Philadelphian Church is the Template Church the temp for Template Christians. Uh, Jesus says in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Okay. Uh, from the What Does the Future Hold series, uh, this series that we're doing here, it's a series of, uh, it's a definitive series on the last book in the Bible, which is the future, a study of interpretation, application. It's a study of hope, a study of answers, and a study of why things are happening, and why you, if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have a thing to be afraid about, but you need to have Christ as your Savior. Please call on him. Uh, let's see here. Things that we are, well, we're going to learn soon. A couple more weeks, we'll be out of this church <coughs> segment. Once we get to, uh, well, uh, I think Revelation 4, is that Laodicea? I think we still have a little bit more, but we're going to be getting to 
666, uh, the number of the beast, which is the, the computer chip thing that you're going to have to have. That's the globalization of identity and everything. The Battle of Armageddon, which is going to be around uh, Israel, uh, as all the nations of the earth gather around Israel. Gee, it sounds like the nations of the earth are gathering around Israel, all right, as we speak. Antichrist, false prophet, these are going to be charismatic political leaders that are going to arise and say, here I am to save the day, and people are going to run to them. We're going to talk about heaven and hell, new heaven, new earth, Satan, <coughs> demons, angels, the new world order, Rome, Europe. Where are we today in God's timeline? And what about Israel, Iran, Russia, China, and USA? Uh, how do they all fit into these things? Uh, what does the Bible say? Well, it talks about worldwide plagues, worldwide economic problems, worldwide war, worldwide apostasy, which is why no one respects pastors anymore because they're a bunch of lions bums. <laughs> That's why. Uh, one world religious system, one world economic system, all these things are falling right into place within the last couple of years. European Union, one world leader, there's going to be one leader for the whole planet instead of for nations. And uh, the, probably the UN will be part of that. Natural disasters. Are we seeing natural disasters? Are we seeing charismatic leaders? Are we seeing false teachers? Bam, 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 bingo, 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 bingo. Checking on all cylinders there. there. Uh, let's move on here. The seven churches, John is told by the voice of the Lord to send a message to the seven churches at Asia. Uh, note John the Apostle probably knew these churches personally as he probably visited them and this is just a little background so you know where we're at this is what we've studied so far we're up to here so these are all churches that signify different timelines in history uh, that signify the age of the church that began at Pentecost Right now, we're studying the Philadelphian church, which is called the Missionary Church, which uh, approximately covers uh, 1750 to the year 1900. And uh, then the last church we're going to cover is the Apostate Church, which is what we're living in today. This is where we are. It began around the year 1900. And I got a question mark because when that ends, we don't know, but probably soon. So church, uh, tonight's church number seven is the Church of Philadelphia. What's the objective? Learn from that old church. Make sure it doesn't happen to our church today. Uh, objective two, how can we learn a life lesson for our personal living today to make us stronger face uh, to face tomorrow? How can we do that? Well, let's see. Okay. Background. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Uh, it is used here in a different way than in seven other times that is used in the New Testament. Uh, for example, in Romans 12.10. But here it speaks of the city's founder. Uh, we spoke, it's about 28 miles southeast of Sardis. Still around today. Uh, Jesus likes this church and people. He says in verse 7, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the keys of David. Uh, the true one, the holy one. The one who controls all things. Who is that? Jesus. That's who is talking here. Jesus says, I like this church. So tonight, this is part four. Let's uh, move on to the end of this study. Uh, so Jesus says in uh, chapter three of Revelation, verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast, which thou hast, that no one take thy crown. So we're going to get into some very heavy things here, and uh, you're going to have to really pay attention uh, because a lot of these things are very cryptic, and we have to do some dissection here. But you can gather from here that Jesus is saying, what's he saying? He comes quickly, okay? That means it's not going to be a long time, okay? Uh, always remember, the Bible says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. When he says, I come quickly, in the whole scheme of time, a thousand years is a blink. It's nothing, okay? He was telling John to tell the Christians, I come quickly. And then he says, hold fast which you have. Hold, what's that? What does it mean, hold fast? Hold on to tightly, tightly 
Don't let go of truth because people are going to try to rip it out of your hands. Don't do it. Let no man take your crown. So, what does we say here? Jesus is coming back soon. When he returns, make sure you're caught doing his work and living his life. I can't emphasize that enough, and it seems that everything we've been teaching lately, if you, if you got to hear Sunday morning, we just said it outright, out, you know, as clear as day in uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 7, uh, the end of all things is at hand. That's what it said. Okay, and what should you be doing? Serving God. What should you do now? What people, what should we be doing? This is a not, this is not a time to be laying around at home, just, you know, just sleeping and doing nothing. There is so much ministry to do. If you got a, if you got one leg, then just hobble on a crutch. Do something. Tell people, be a light. Uh, this is, you know what? You don't want to get caught with your feet up watching Netflix. When the Lord returns, there are so many people who are looking for Jesus, so many people who are hurt. And whose job is it? Every child of God, us, to share our faith. You know, we've been quiet for so long, and I was talking to somebody else, and we laughed. And they were saying, you know what, it's time. Everyone's coming out of the closet. You know who needs to come out of the closet? Christians. We need to come out of the closet because we've been hiding. We're so afraid. We're so, we don't want to upset anybody. So we keep our mouths shut. We've got the truth of Jesus Christ and we are so timid and quiet. We just shut up. And the, is, is the world quiet about what they believe? Are they timid? Are they embarrassed? No. Nope. They're right in your face screaming. And we're like, okay, don't want to offend anyone. People. People are, are going to their death to a burning house, and we're saying, you know, be careful there. Uh, instead of throwing, giving them the water of life, Jesus Christ, whether they want it or not, at least we need to tell them. Uh, make sure you don't get discouraged and stop fighting the good fight while here. Boy, have you felt the powers and the forces to get you discouraged lately? Well, I sure have. I think every day I want to give up and say, that's it, done. This is too much. It's, it's, it's tiring, you know, and you, you're fighting the good fight. You, you're helping this person here. You're ministering to that person, and you just get that thing taken care of, and then another person, another problem comes up, and the enemy is pounding you. Then you got your own physical things and your own pains and your own things, and you're like, ah, I give up. Let him go to hell, you know, and you can see it happening, and Jesus warns. We're going to get tired and we're going to get discouraged and we're going to say, what's the point? What's the point? As we have when you walk, if you've ever noticed in, behind our front doors of the church, there, when you walk in, we have a sign. This is a kind of one of our slogans here. Life is hard, but God is good. I don't pull any punches, people. Life is hard, Okay. I know a lot of churches are selling this party every day thing. It's, it, it's a lie because I don't know about you. I ain't living a party every day, okay? Life is hard. It's difficult. There's setbacks, there's kids, sicknesses, money problems. I, I tell you, people are really struggling out there. I've never seen so many people calling me, Pastor, I need a place to live. I need a place to live. I need an apartment. I need a car. I need this. I need that. I need food. It's just my family's falling apart. I'm getting a divorce. I don't know what to do. I'm losing my kid. He's got caught on drugs. They're just overwhelmed, overwhelmed with so much. They can't handle it. They're snapping. I tell you, people are just, they can't take it. They can't take it. But God is good, people. You've got to remember that. He's good. So Jesus says, and well, what does he mean when he says this? Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take the crown. Important points here. This term crowns means rewards, okay? When you die as a Christian, okay, you're going to get rewards, okay, for the things you've done as you lived in this life in the Spirit. Rewards can be taken away. We, we know that scripture that says uh, there'll be, uh, some will be tried, uh, you know, by, and by, you'll have your wood, hay, and stubble and your gold and precious silver. Some of the things uh, we're not going to get rewarded for. And what does that mean? Uh, this is a, a great example of this. 
uh, is, let's say you served in church for 20 years and you were the pew cleaner and you polished the pews and everything. You got that job, but you hated it. And, and you were resentful for it. I got to clean these stinking pews every week. Nobody ever says anything. God says, you know what? You get no rewards. Those things that you did for God, that you did in the spirit, you know, because you wanted to. How many people, I don't want to be at church today. When is the time to go home? You know, church attendance is at its lowest uh, level ever. People just don't care. And uh, the people who are sitting there going, when is this going to be over? You get no reward for faithfulness because you didn't want to be there. Okay. Salvation cannot be taken away, praise God. 2 Timothy 2.13, Romans 8. Though we can never lose our salvation, our rewards in heaven can be less by how we lived here on earth. Okay, this is a very interesting uh, and thing here. Okay, so hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. What does this mean? It mostly, it's mostly how we deal with people that affects how God rewards us, okay? How we deal with people. You know why that's important? Because that's the hardest thing to do. What problem? I, I don't have too many, too many problems dealing with my cat or dealing with a dog. I like them. I love animals. They're not a problem, you know? I got a problem with people. <laughs> they are the hardest thing to deal with. You know, if you look over anybody's life, what's your biggest problem? I mean, besides life, you have cancer or something. For the most part, the people who come to me for counseling and stuff like that, it's always people problems. I can't stand this person. This person insult me. This person ripped my heart out. This person, I'm mad at them. They're mad at me. Who insulted who? Who said this? Misquoted me. People. Okay? That's, that's a hard one. So God is watching and waiting. And we should do the same knowing that he is. Be patient. Good times are coming for those who believe. That's a promise. And boy, I'm looking forward to some good times. I don't know about you guys. Because I'm getting tired of these hard times. I want some good times. Okay. Okay. Verse 12 gets complicated. Okay. He that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is in New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him a new name. Well, what the heck does that mean? Let's see what we got here. Well, let's break it down. 12a. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. B, and I will write upon him the name of my God and see the name of the city, my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven uh, from my God, and I will write upon him a new name. So let's go. Okay, overcoming sin has a reward. He that overcomes will I make a pillar. Overcometh are those who overcome sin's curse by trusting in the cleansing blood of Christ. Have you trusted in the cleansing blood of Christ? Your sins are forgiven. That's what salvation is. You don't do good deeds to get to heaven or anything. You trust God because what do we need? Forgiveness. Who's the only one who can forgive us? God. How is it done? Through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So you are an overcomer if you, you're a believer if you trusted in the blood of Christ. How do we know this? 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And we have some scripture references, Revelation 2, 7, 2, 17, 2, 26, 3, 5, and 3, 21. So a complicated thing made simple. He that overcometh is those who are believers. You're an overcomer, okay? Even you, know, you might not feel like an overcomer, but you are. Okay, continue, overcoming continued, okay, let him hear. He that has an ear, what does God say? You have no excuse, okay? If you, I gave you two, okay, you got two ears, okay? I gave you two ears, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Let him hear with the Spirit, we have an uppercase S, this means Holy Spirit, says unto the churches, 
He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay, very interesting things here. And uh, we went over this back when we were in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, what happens to those who, uh, who he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death? Well, what is the second death? Lake of fire. Okay, and for another study, and I've taught on it before, but it's a real fascinating study, the study of hell, which really has, it's, it's one place, but it's four places. Uh, th three of them are in the earth. One of them is off the earth and out of space, which is the lake of fire. It's a very fascinating study. Uh, we know this because Revelation 20:14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Hell was cast into the lake of fire? Yes, hell is emptied out and thrown into the lake of fire. That's for another study. But this is the important part. Who, who, whosoever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. That's the second death. So Jesus is talking about this here. Now, how do you get to heaven? You've got to have your name written in the book of life. How do you get your name written in the book of life? By belonging to a denomination, a church, uh, doing a lot of good deeds, giving money, serving, working? No. have to have your sins washed by the blood of Christ. Okay, how to avoid the second death, John 3, 3. Okay, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, which is actually born from above, uh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I say you must be born again, born a, a spiritual be, uh, birth. First Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, simple rule. And so you can under, and I've said this before, but it's, it's always nice when you see it up there. Always remember this. If you are born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you die once. I know that sounds weird, but think about this. If you're born physically one time, and then you die physically one time, then you're going to die spiritually a second time, which is the second death. Okay, that means you had no spiritual birth. You were born into this world. You lived your whole life. You had no connection with God. You're born just one time. When you die, you're going to die physically and then spiritually. Well, how do I avoid, how do I avoid that? If you are born twice, you die once. No second death. If we're, if born once physically and then second spiritually, that's when you say, today is the day I call on Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You're born once physically. You're born second spiritually. What does that mean? When you die, you don't die a second death. You only just die physically. There is no second death because you have been born twice. I know it's a little bit of a riddle there, but uh, it says it quite clear. Revel, uh, John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Very verily I say unto thee, except the man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. And we know this, Nicodemus, the Jewish guy says, how, how can you be born again? How can you, can you go into your mother's womb? He's taking it literally and then be born again? No, that ain't going to work. Uh, that is what of, of the spirit is a spirit that is of the flesh is flesh. Uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, number one, is, is our first birth birth and that which is born of the spirit is spirit our second birth marvel not that i say you must be born again okay and i will write upon so i did all that to explain this those who are not affected by the second death those who are overcomers those who are believers jesus says i will write upon him you me whoever is a believer the name of my god identification Okay, it's like your hand stamped. What is going to be written on you? The name of our Savior. Who is he? Jesus. Our new address? Heaven. You're going to have your own distinct name. Faithful and true. Child of God. Okay, that's what sets you apart. Now, today when, when people ask you, well, what are you? What kind of faith do you, you know, what denomination is? I always think it's fun to say, I'm a child of the living God. <laughs> I go, why? What does that mean? I'm a child of God. You know, Bible-believing Christian. They don't know what to make of that. 
Revelation 2.17, uh, to him that overcometh, there's that word again, overcometh, means believer, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. Remember we did that in church on a Sunday morning once. We, we did the white stone, and everybody wrote their name on it. And in the, in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, save in he that receiveth. Okay. Uh, Revelation 3.12c, And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Uh, we'll study, and we'll study that when we get to Revelation 21. New Jerusalem, that you talk about complicated stuff. When we get to the new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, it's very complicated. It's very bizarre. And that's going to be for another study. Uh, but there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. It's interesting, you know, the earth is going to be destroyed. God says, I'm going to destroy it completely. Burn it up. I'm going to make it all new. Brand new. Okay? Completely restored. Uh, as we chose, as we close the Church of Philadelphia, uh, Revelation 3.13, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Okay, next week, the last church, number seven, Revelation 3.14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Not that God had creation, but when God created everything, before that creation, God already had this written down, okay? And that church that we're going to discuss, that's the most interesting to me. The last one is the Laodicean church because it defines where we are right now in human history. It is called what? What's the nickname? Lukewarm church. It's called the lukewarm church. It's a little bit in the world, a little bit in, the, in, in church. We don't know where we are. Yeah, I like church, but I sure like having a good party too. So let's bring them all together. And we have church service, you know, and that's what the church has become today. Kind of this big circus party thing. And Jesus says the harshest words you're ever going to hear. What does he say? He goes, I vomit you out of my mouth. I, I can't even, I spit you out. Okay. Yep. He says, you know what? I'd rather you choose a side than to be lukewarm. I don't know about you guys. There are, you know, I like things cold and some things hot. I like very few things lukewarm, right? Lukewarm coffee is like, bah! <laughs> you know, either make it iced coffee or hot coffee. I don't want lukewarm anything. You know, a person who's lukewarm in love with you. Well, I love you, but I really don't. Kind of in the middle. I don't want to be in love with someone like that. I want to, you know, I want you either love me all the way or don't. And I want nothing to do with you. And God basically says to the church of today and uh, Revelation 3.20 we'll get to, which we use a lot as a salvation scripture. He says those words, behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's a very interesting scripture because he's not talking about he's standing at the door of our heart. He's standing at the door of the church because Jesus has been kicked out of his own church. Jesus is saying, when we get to that, that my own church doesn't want me. We got it, Jesus, because this church, the Laodicean church, has the most money, the most success. They're, they're doing great. They're growing. They're so successful, they figured out all the ways to just have this massive, high-tech thing that, Jesus, we don't even need you anymore. And Jesus is out there going, guys, can I come in and join you? No, no, we got a party going on. You got to stay out there, Jesus. You got to put a downer on the whole thing. Okay? We don't want to hear any of that word of God stuff. We got a party. And I know I'm being very facetious people and sarcastic, but you know what I mean. And you know what's going on out there. And if the Apostle Paul was alive today as he was, and he would go to visit these churches and write them letters. Remember, all the letters that Paul wrote to those churches, most of them were saying, what are you guys doing? What the heck happened? I left the church, I came back. You guys uh, have a, are a freak show. 
Paul was constantly correcting. And I tell you, if the Apostle Paul was looking at the churches today, maybe even our church, he would probably find a whole bunch of things wrong and go, what are you guys doing? How quickly have you drifted away from the truth? I would hope he wouldn't say that, but that's what the last church is going to be. And then after uh, we finish the Laodicean church, then we get into the things that I know you guys really want to get into. Okay, the real end time stuff about the Antichrist and the seven year tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, uh, the attack on Israel, the rapture of the church, the thousand year reign of, of, of Christ, all the wars, the, you know, uh, hail, the size, like, hundred pound hail coming, falling from the sky, earthquakes and volcanoes and meteorites. And it's going to be a, a crazy time. It's going to be a horrible time. And it talks about it, about the mark of the beast, about complete chaos, uh, political leaders. It talks about all those things that are coming. And it's very fascinating. And it even gives us some clues of trying to figure out who's this Antichrist? Who's, who's going to be this world leader? That, by the way, if you're a believer, you'll never get to see them because you'll be gone before they come. So one of, one of the good things is, is once we get past this, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about is stuff that we'll never see. It's coming in the future. Thank God. Okay? Because I don't want to be around. I'm not bad enough living in this life. Okay? <laughs> I'm bad enough living the way things are right now. I don't want to see anything worse than this. Just let me hide in my backyard and I'll go hang out with Rory. We'll plant some plants for Rory right back there. We'll just have some gardens. Just sell tomatoes. Everybody leave me alone. You know, I, I don't, this is, it's getting too crazy out there for me. I want to like dig a hole and bury myself. But that's not what we're supposed to do. It's, it's, it's going to be very tempting to want to dig a hole and bury ourselves. Okay. And if you listen to our show last night, Life Talk Live, Let's Talk Live, we spoke about the tendency we all have to want to sleep. I'm just going to bed. Just call me when this is over, you know? Going under the covers, I ain't coming out until I hear some good news. And, and more and more people are doing that. You know what? I'm just, you know, sleeping has become our new drug. It's like heroin, you know? It's our escape. I can escape all this darkness, and and to a, to a certain degree, uh, sleep is an escape. It's a drug. That's why you know you don't want to get up again. It's interesting, you know. Michael Jackson. Remember Michael Jackson? You know what he? Remember he had that doctor who would put him really basically under general anesthesia for like long periods of time, and then leave him like that. And why was he like that? Because he was not a happy person. And he didn't want to deal, so just knock me out. And I have to tell you, some of the happiest times of my life is when I get anesthesia. I love it. I don't feel anything. I go get my teeth pulled. I always tell them, Give me, knock me out. Don't feel a thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's who was I talking to, talking to this about? And it was so true. Uh, you know, you think about a child. Uh, I was, you know, Maybe let us understand what heaven is like. Because a lot, you know, a lot of people are afraid of dying. As a believer, you shouldn't be afraid of dying. It's because this isn't the end. We're going to the beginning. And we were talking about when you're a baby in the womb. Now I have, I'm, I'm going to have my first grandchild and I have my grand, my uh, daughter-in-law has a baby. She's in her womb growing. And does that baby want to come out? No. It's the best place to live. You got to do nothing. Everything is provided for you. That's why they're screaming, crying where they come out. They got, get me back in there. You start crying when you come out and you cry for the rest of your life, you know. But you know what? Heaven should be wanting to go back in because going to be with the Lord is going like back into the womb. God's womb, I think, and somebody said this, and I say, that's pretty profound that it's kind of like going back into the womb because what's the best place to be heaven people it really is what does the bible say about heaven no more tears no more pain 
no more sorrow, no more worry, no more sickness, no, no, none of that, you know? And everybody wants to live for this life. And, you know, I don't mean we're supposed to just kill ourselves or anything, but what keeps us going is looking forward to being with our Father one day, okay? I look forward to it, you know what? And the worse this world gets, the more I look forward to it. You know, I used to look forward to the summer's gone. I'm going to do this, going to do that. It's like, ah, I just want to be with God. Uh, this is too rough down here. It's getting rough. And But while we're here, we have work to do. We've got to be more bold with our faith and tell people about Jesus Christ and everything. And I mean, I wouldn't go into all this revelation stuff. You scare people away. But But you can say... Easily, because people ask me all the time, and probably because I'm a pastor, but a lot of places I go, people know who the, I, you know, who I am, and they always ask. So, what do you think is going on, Pastor Scott? You know, I go to the hardware store or wherever I go, and it's easy for me to say, "Well, it's quite simple. This is what God said is going to happen." Okay, that's why, because people are like, "Why is this happening? What do you think? What does it mean?" I'll tell you what it means. It means we don't got much time. It means. We've just turned the page in human history. And there are pages that God turns. And he turns pages. And he turns pages. Some, you know, a season of your life ends and a new season begins. I believe we're very close to an ending of an old season turning to a new season. And, uh, you know, and there's that time in between. I don't know when it is. Oh, could it be a thousand years from now? Yeah, it could. I don't think so. I don't know if we're going to last five years. I don't know the way things are going unless something supernaturally changes and everyone bows their knee to Jesus Christ and gets saved. I don't know how we're getting out of this mess because there's so much division and hate and just fighting and riots. I, I, you can't fix it unless Jesus fixes the heart. But if the people don't want Jesus, they're not going to get fixed. And that's why when God removes the church out of the picture, the Antichrist comes along and he gives everybody what they want, okay? And everybody's going to love that guy and they're going to vote for him and he's going to be the greatest and the best and you're going to get, you want that, you got it. You want that, you got it. And for the first three and a half years of the tribulation, it's going to be pretty good. No wars, no, going to heal sicknesses and stuff. After those three and a half years is when it gets really, really bad. And then after those three and a half years, uh, the world does come around Israel to destroy it uh, at the at the uh, Battle of Armageddon in the Valley of Megiddo. And Jesus comes down to stop it and says, that's it. I've had enough with you people. He ends World War III uh, before it begins, but it's just getting ready to start. So where are we in that time frame? How close? I don't know. Uh, it could be tomorrow. It could be a year from now. It could be 100 years from now. But the way things are looking, I don't know how we're going to turn this ship around, people. It, it, it's Every day it's worse. Every day it's, it's very frightening. But if your father is Jesus Christ, if your father is your Savior, and you've trusted in him, but nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, in this world we're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. Okay? We should be the ones who are smiling when the world is crying and so the world can say, what are you smiling about? Don't you see what's going on? Yeah, I know. But I also know my father in heaven and he's got a, he's prepared a place for me and he's prepared a place for you. And he's going to come again. And get me out of here. Okay. Uh, and I look forward to that day. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for tonight, Lord. Uh, we thank you, Lord. Uh, that we have something to look forward to, Lord. We don't, we don't have to dread each day, Lord. Uh, every day is a, is a new beginning, Lord. Uh, we don't even know if we'll be here tomorrow. You, you, only you know that. We go to, our, our goal is from right now until we go to bed. And then tomorrow morning, if you give us that day, then we have a day to serve you, go to work. And, and we could enjoy life. We could have fun and, and enjoy things and smile. As a matter of fact, we should be enjoying them more than we've ever enjoyed them. And let the world see us enjoying all the beauties of God, all of his wonders, his creation, and, and uh, the plants and the animals, and just, just marveling at their majesty and, and saying, wow, God, you're incredible. And let people see us not in fear, but in boldness and confidence, 
knowing that our God is a good God. He does good things, and you've got to know him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.